Color science and VFX in computer graphics is mostly a mystery to almost everyone working in this field. Parts of it can get really complex, but you seem pretty smart. Okay, hear me out. Let's get through the boring theory stuff together quickly, then we'll dive into how it's used on film and television, and more importantly, how you can make something like this look like this. I've bashed my head into my fair share of color mishaps on projects. Color can be tricky. Okay, type of shoes. We're going down the rabbit hole and into color land. Let's go. Colors, you got red, blue, and green. You mix them up and you get yellow and purple and orange. It's easy, it's child stuff. Except it gets a bit more complicated when you try to measure our perception of color. As humans, we can see a very specific range of light between 400 and 700 nanometers. Anything beyond that range is invisible to our eyes. When we look at an object, three types of wavelengths of light reach the receptors at the back of our eyes, specifically the red, green, and blue cones that are responsible for detecting color. And the rods detect luminance. And there you have it, that's color. So how do we measure what we perceive? Well, in 1931, scientists conducted an experiment where they asked people to recreate the hue of colors they saw by combining red, green, and blue. After repeating this exercise with numerous participants, they were able to create a diagram called the CIE 1931 Two Degree Standard Observer. Cool name. This result quantifies how sensitive the human eye is when responding to color and the average of what we can see. This diagram, graphed in a 3D space using the core coordinates of RGB as a result of their findings. To simplify things further, they plotted the results of the 3D diagram back onto an XY graph, which gave rise to the CIE 1931 chromaticity diagram, even cooler name, which represents all the visible colors our eyes can perceive. This allowed us to map colors onto a 2D graph and assign a coordinate to each point of color perceivable by the human eye, which is pretty cool. Good job, math. All right, let's unravel the colorful world of color spaces in VFX. But before we dive in, have you ever wondered why we can't just agree on one color space and call it a day? Well, it turns out color space is like your typical VFX client, always changing their minds and confusing us more and more every day. So what exactly is a color space? It's a bunch of math applied to an image to standardize the way that we see it across devices and software. It's two things, really. A color gamut really just refers to the range of colors and a luminance curve, how bright or dark the colors are, otherwise known as a gamma curve or tone mapping curve. Unless you're looking at the raw image file, which just means unprocessed image data, or working in linear which just means there is no luminance mapping, it'll usually be a logarithmic curve. Why? Well, because it lifts the values only in the dark areas and allows us to see more details while maintaining the brighter areas of the image, because after a certain point, bright is just bright and our eyes don't really allow us to see more details in brighter areas. So, you know, remember that you shouldn't stare directly at the sun. However, they are pretty good at making out details in dark areas, as I'm sure you've noticed that your eyes will adjust and adapt to see things while in a dark room. For example, this footage is viewed in linear. If you pay attention to the graph, this line is very linear. Maintaining a one-to-one -one relationship, what you put in is exactly what you see. No surprises, no tricks, just pure unadulterated linearity. It's like going on a date with somebody who's predictably consistent. As we switch over to the sRGB, however, prepare to be amazed as this logarithmic curve swoops in and lifts those darker values up to the light. It's like giving a boost to the underdogs, the shy pixels hiding in the shadows. Imagine a pixel with an input value of 0.2 timidly lurking in the dark corners of your image. Suddenly, with the flick of a switch, that little pixel gets catapulted to an intensity value of around 0.5. The light values, however, remain unchanged. Those bright pixels continue to shine with the same brilliance, proudly maintaining their value of 1. Okay, back to the regular schedule of program. Anyways, gamma curves, gamuts, you put these two buddies together and now you're coloring. Now, if you're busy pushing pixels around and playing with colors all day, you've probably come across terms like Rec. 709, Log, Linear, sRGB, and Asus. And while these might sound like secret launch codes, they're just plain old color spaces. I can already hear you asking, why so many? Well, there are different standards that proliferate to fit the needs of different cases. For instance, Rec. 709 is often used for broadcast media worldwide on various devices. The idea is that it ensures that all of your favorite shows are on the same page color-wise and look somewhat consistent no matter what and where you're watching. Color spaces can vary depending on technology and device you're using. For instance, movie theaters use a different color space called DCI-P3 for projection because it has a bigger color gamut, meaning it can display more colors. So the next time you want to convince your friends or partner to go see a movie in theaters instead of watching it at home, just remind them of the massive range of colors that they'll be missing out on. That's sure to motivate them. In today's world of VFX and CGI, the color space of choice is Asus. It's the new kid in town. It was developed by the Academy. Yep, that one. 
to provide us with all the color transforms needed to comply with most cameras and final output monitors. It's like a big old meeting where they decided, hey, let's all agree on the same color standards, people. So from the tiniest studio to the grandest production house, we're all on the same page when it comes to color. It's like a color language that bridges the gap, making sure your visuals look top notch no matter what device they're viewed on. So in theory, you can use any camera, convert your raw footage to ACES, work in ACES, and then convert the output to the color space of your TV screen or theater projection. The ACES color space has one of the largest color gamuts, which is confusing because that doesn't mean that you'll suddenly get psychedelic vision and start seeing new colors, just that you've got a bigger playground or range of colors to mess around with while you're working. The ACES workflow boils down to these two concepts, IDT, an input device transform, and ODT, an output device transform. Think of them as the dynamic duo of color transforms, working together to convert your images from one color space to another. The color party can't start without the IDT, and it won't end until the ODT has done its business. Both of them should be set up before you start working. The input transform converts the image from its original color space to your working color space. So if your texture was exported as sRGB, you'd want to set your input color space to sRGB and the output to your working color space. In our case, our beloved ASUS CG. In Nuke, this can also be done directly on the read node by setting the input color transform. See, it's the same as if we left the read node to raw and used a color transform node instead. The ODT can be found at the top of your screen here. By switching this to sRGB ASUS, it will display a preview of what your image will look like on an sRGB monitor, like computer screens. You can select Rec. 709 to see what it would look like in that color space, more commonly used on projectors and TVs, or DCI-P3 for theater projectors to mimic what you'll see on the silver screen. Are those still a thing? That doesn't seem like a thing. The ACES viewing LUTs have a bright value roll-off, so it's normal that otherwise very bright areas might end up looking a little bit more grayish. This quirkiness is all part of the grand plan to give you more range to work with on your journey to the final result. There are other things besides IDTs and ODTs that might affect the overall look of your images. CDLs and LUTs CDLs and LUTs alter the overall look on the creative side, giving your pixels a colorful makeover. A CDL is short for Color Decision List. It's basically a file that you can import that holds basic color correction operations that can vary from shot to shot. It has its limitations, but they can still be tweaked. The LUT lookup table is usually uneditable, so it's like a set formula that works its magic across the entire film. It gives a coherent look across the board. This is usually applied at the very end of the script before writing out your file. The general workflow is to do all of your work before you apply any color corrections. Then use the CDL first using a CDL node, followed by the LUT applied by a vector field node. This way you'll be able to see what your final image will look like with all the color operations applied when you view from the bottom of your node network. So in practice, there are three main points of a CG pipeline that need to be color managed. Texture painting, rendering, and compositing. With that, let's take a look at how we should set up ACES and Substance Painters so that we're viewing and exporting in the ACES color space. So start the way you always do, new project. In the color management tab, set Set the color management to open color IO. They're the higher powers that make this ACES stuff. And set the config to 1.2 because the bigger the number, the better, right? By default, the color space of the textures you import are assumed to be sRGB, and the textures you export will also be converted to sRGB. That's probably fine. We'll, we'll leave it unless you specifically need or want to pre-convert your textures to ACES before rendering, in which case all you have to do is specify ACES as the export color space. You'll notice your ODT at the top of your substance viewport. You can use whatever viewing LUT you want, depending on where your final images will be seen, but more importantly, you'll want to make sure that whatever ODT you view from, that you're using the same one in all of the DCCs throughout your workflow, unless maybe you're the kind of crazy who actually enjoys eyeballing the look of each image by hand to match the look in the previous software. Next, we'll need to be sure our textures being read by our renderer are all in the correct color space, and that our DCC is also set up to the correct working color space. If you're using Maya 2023 and beyond, this is all set up very easily for you by default. So you could probably skip over this whole part. If you check under color management in your preferences, you'll notice that the OCIO config is already loaded once you select enable color management. The rendering space is set to ACES CG by default and your ODT is set to sRGB. This is good. When building your materials, if you set your substance exports to sRGB, then you'll want to set the color space to sRGB on the file or image node. This tells Maya to convert the textures from sRGB to ACES CG when rendering. You'll also want to keep normal maps and floating point maps like roughness and metallic and bumps set to raw. Your render should more or less match what you were seeing in Substance Painter. Gone are the days trying to match painter results by eye. And finally, similarly to working in 3D, we'll need to be sure that our renders and plates are all being correctly color managed, and that Nuke is set to the correct ACES color space. In Nuke, you'll want to set the color management to OCIO under the color tab in your project settings. Select ACES 1.2 as your config because that's what we did in Substance, remember? Read in your render, since we rendered as ACES CG, 
we'll want to set the input color space as ACCG as well. If you're dealing with live action footage, you'll also want to set the input color transform to whatever the original footage's color space is so that it can also convert it to your working ACES color space. Once again, ensure that your ODT viewing LUT is set to whatever you were using in the other DCCs, so in our case, sRGB. Now your color should look more or less the same all across your workflow throughout every DCC that you've been using. When writing out your final image from Nuke, you can again decide to transform color spaces depending on your needs. So that's it, colors. It can be a real pain in the ass to set up and confirm that everything is working, but once it's done, it's done. And everything you do should look better and be easier to deal with until your client says otherwise. So good luck.